she's off. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I did that. Yeah, well, you know what? You're you're you just you're, you've been recorded, so <laughs> it's late in the day. I can't believe I did that. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. All right, I'll, well, I'll keep quiet. I can't believe. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, <laughs> welcome everyone. This is Ari and Serena with Shattering the Matrix. Uh, boy, we're having a good time. We haven't even started. Um, and we have our beloved friend James Bartley with us. Boy, what a treat that is. Uh, we haven't had him for quite a while. And actually, we haven't had a show in quite a while because we've been busy doing other stuff. So, but the, uh, show today promises to be very interesting because it's a topic that uh, a lot of people are really resonating with or following and there's just a lot of information and disinformation out there that uh, we just can't really you know see the trees anymore <laughs> so uh, we figured well let's all discuss this uh, topic and that's the topic of Nibiru uh, slash planet X or planet 7x or whatever the latest name is who the heck knows and uh, uh, but it's just the topic that's uh, very interesting to me and I believe it's interesting to James and I know that Serena has been very well read with these uh, Sakurai Sitchin uh, information so I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation uh, and and for all of those who are not uh, yet familiar with James, uh, he's been in several of our shows and he's been probably the catalyst uh, to open up a lot of people's awareness with respect to ETs that are not necessarily, uh, you know, of the positive kind. And uh, so he's been, uh, you know, instrumental in creating that kind of awareness. And I, I thank him very much for doing that. Um, but uh, James Bartley uh, is an alien abductee uh, and veteran UFO researcher with an emphasis on reptilian abductions and military abductions. Uh, he has spent much time in the high desert of Southern California, Nevada, and Arizona uh, investigating alien abductions, underground and undersea alien bases, and joint human-alien underground and undersea bases. Uh, he will be featured in the upcoming documentary by Chris Turner called uh, Don't Mention the Reptilians. James is an independent historian with an emphasis on military history, intelligence, counterintelligence, and special operations. James, I can't even thank you enough for being with us, so welcome again. Thank you, Ari, and thank you, Serena. This is quite an honor, and it's a very timely show because a lot of people are, are really deeply interested in the subject and, and they have a lot of questions and, and my goal is to uh, raise awareness and uh, have people who listen tune into their own uh, inner guidance and their own intuition and let it guide them where it will and uh, you know don't take anything I say as gospel I'm not the shell answer man I, I I'm a researcher and I, and I go by my own intuition and internal guidance as well and I also bounce these thoughts and, and ideas off of other people whom I respect greatly such as yourselves so it, the intent is to raise awareness and get people thinking about this and, and how the subject uh, if they feel it's a uh, value to them, how it impacts their life and what they can do about it. Very awesome. Um, so what I'd like to do, um, James, is to, um, you know, pose a question out there because a lot of people are kind of like, uh, you know, don't really understand these terminologies. Like, for example, what is Nibiru? Because, uh, you know, obviously uh, Sitchin, uh, you know, equates it being perhaps the planet uh, that where the Anunnaki come from, right? The Anunnaki being those ETs that uh, apparently were here on, on planet Earth that had a pro possible, um, you know, in, in, intervened with uh, our genetics, perhaps, uh, possibly made us slaves, you know, all that. So that's one aspect of Nibiru. Then we have what we call Planet X, uh, or now 7X, as it's now being called by a gentleman called uh, Gil Broussard, which I uh, have been listening to lately. Very interesting information. We'll discuss that a little bit. Um, and uh, so we've got to kind of like talk a little bit. Is it really a planet? Uh, is it part of, of a solar system that maybe might be a dwarf, a brown dwarf that might be part of our suns, you know, like a binary, uh, you know, system. Uh, so these are all the things that we would like to uh, address as well as, you know, is it coming 
anytime soon to this neck of our woods. You know, is is are we going to be experiencing uh, this Nibiru situation or Planet X situation anytime soon? Uh, because in my humble opinion, I believe that what we're seeing in the world today in terms of what people are calling global uh, warming and whatnot could be perturbations from some kind of a cosmic uh, body out there that might be causing this. So um, what is your, first of all, let's, let's discuss uh, how you became interested in this and what led you to do this research because I'm a, you know, an avid researcher as well with this. So what led you to that and what do you think this uh, Nibiru slash Planet X or whatever it is, what, what is it? Thank you, uh, Ari. I, I became interested when I became aware of, of consciously aware of Sitchin's work and, and some of the uh, similar Babylonian epics, like the I think it's called the Enuma Alash, and also I've, I've delved into the work of Dr. Joseph Farrell. He wrote the uh, the Cosmic War, which is a very good book, and he also wrote the the Giza Death Star trilogy. Uh, I don't bl- I don't buy into everything he says. Uh, he's part of that school that holds the the uh, you know the Nazi advanced research accounts for you know most if not all of you know the early UFO sightings. I hope I'm not misquoting him on that, but he seems to think that Roswell was a recovery of a German craft, which I don't agree with. But it's a side issue. But the point of relevance is is his book called The Cosmic War, as well as the. Uh, the Giza Death Star Trilogy, The Grid of the Gods, a few other books he's written. And what really brought it home for me was all the imagery I've seen over the years uh, on YouTube of uh, video and still imagery of what appears to be a second sun. Uh, there's a lot of like misnomers and misconceptions about the whole subject. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the lore, uh, Sitchin uh, postulates that roughly every 3,600 years, this what amounts to a mini solar system that's kind of a twin uh, part of a binary uh, system with our own sun comes back to Earth. It, it's on a long elliptical orbit, and uh, at the furthest reaches of its orbit, uh, it'll it'll then turn and head back to our solar system. And as it gets closer to the solar system, the slingshot boomerang effect kicks in and it starts accelerating as it gets closer to our solar system. Uh, And people like Gerald Clark, who's done a lot of research on the Anunnaki, who was himself a skeptic about the whole Second Sun Nibiru issue, he did the calculations, he did the math, he did the research, and to his surprise, he, he realized that, yes, it's quite possible this mini solar system has come back and it's been in our solar system at least since 2004 and then we look back at the statements that people like Ronald Reagan were making on no less than five occasions he talked about how uh, during his his alleged presidency that uh, perhaps the only chance humanity has is if some uh, unspecified threat from beyond were to come and threaten all of humanity uh, thereby forcing us to to uh, to unite uh, and thereby help us overcome whatever cosmic challenges uh, are coming back, right, or coming towards us. There's also the issue of the celestially driven driven cataclysms. Uh, If one reads books such as uh, Catastrophe about uh, this comet that had come back into our solar system at about 9500 BC, if one reads about the... uh, celestially driven cataclysms and its effect on geology, how within the geological record there is a a lot of evidence that uh, our planet has gone through a tremendous amount of upheaval in in the recent past, within the last 11, 12,000 years or even more recently. And in terms of geological time, that's quite recent. That's like last week. Uh, Also, the parallel mass extinction events in the fossil record where not only are there tremendous geological upheavals, uh, tremendous mountain ranges being pushed up uh, seemingly uh, in a short span of time as as well as deep deep crevices and deep valleys produced seemingly uh, over a short period of time. There is also a parallel mass extinction uh, going on in the fossil record. 
and we have evidence of, of whales and, uh, and other uh, aquatic uh, animals being washed up high up on mountaintops, so on and so forth. And, and then on top of that, we have the, the lore, which is common throughout the, the world uh, in traditional societies about celestially driven cataclysms, deluges, etc., etc. So what really brought it home to me was seeing these videos of what appears to be a second sun. And the misconception, which I mentioned earlier, is that a lot of people refer to the second sun as Nibiru. Actually, the second sun is, is what's been described as a brown dwarf, mm -hmm. but it actually could be more like a red dwarf. And there's a, it has its own attached solar system. Right. Uh, and some people reckon that there may be up to, including the moons, of this mini solar system, there may be up to seven astronomical bodies, two of which could be very large, uh, Nibiru being one of them, and Nibiru being estimated anywhere from four to eight times the size of Earth. Right. Now, the brown dwarf itself, people should understand that the, the brown dwarf is conservatively estimated at two to three times the size of Jupiter. However, astronomers two years ago in 2014 have found uh, through deep space uh, observation a brown dwarf, I forget what constellation it was found in, a brown dwarf that was fully 60 times the size of Jupiter. Wow. So some of these brown dwarfs can be quite large. And the, not only are we seeing the... I'm satisfied that a lot of the imagery I've seen from, say, 2003, 2004 on, up to quite recently where this this mini solar system has gotten so close that we can even see in some of the footage some of the planets not just yep. the, the the second sun itself but which is quite large i've seen it with the naked eye yeah I i've have seen too. it with the naked eye at the two o'clock position yep uh, at, uh around dusk about five thirty, five forty five p.m uh, it must be understood that the, the chemtrail agenda is multifaceted. It's not just intended to uh, be a slow kill yep. uh, uh, mechanism of you know polluting uh, our skies, polluting ourselves, polluting the soil, uh, nanobots, morgellons, whatever the case may be. But it's also intended to obscure this second sun, this mini solar system. I'm convinced that if the perma chemtrail haze was not there and people have everyone has seen this fake cloud cover yep. since when are, are are clouds that low in, in in the atmosphere and since when does the bottom of these very dark clouds not only do they not emit rain despite how dark these clouds are but sometimes the bottom edge of the, uh, this fake cloud cover is not only very dark but it, it is at times as straight as a ruler's edge and you can see a small gap between the horizon whether it's a mountain range, the ocean, uh, flat land, whatever the case may be, and the bottom of the the, uh, the fake cloud cover, there's a small gap in between, which sometimes uh, multiple sources of light, not just one, can be seen poking out or momentarily uh, not covered, not obscured by this fake cloud cover. And they like to spray in the evening uh, where sunrise uh, is likely to be uh, so when the sun does rise it's a good time to see the the, the second solar system right. uh, the, the that part of the sky is obscured uh, likewise uh, at sun at dusk and sunset and I've also seen it uh, I've definitely seen it at sunset yep. the the fake cloud cover is, is is sprayed in advance where the sun will set but that much being said people around the world dedicated uh, Planet X Second Sun watchers have gotten video, uh, which I'm satisfied clearly shows to me not only uh, the second sun, but also at times the smaller uh, uh, planets. And, and one point I'd like to make before I pass it on to you and Serena uh, for discussion is there's also a plasma electric effect at work. Mm -hmm. Those, some, I'm sure many of your listeners, being as, as sharp as they are, are familiar with the work of Professor James McCanney, familiar with the work of uh, uh, David Talbot and uh, uh, Wall Thornhill, who, who do uh, the Thunderbolts website as well as the Electric Universe website. Yeah. Uh, in, in short, the, 
the scientific model of, of stellar and galactic formation is all wrong. Uh, we live in a plasma electric universe, and, and what I've seen in some of the video I've seen, which is quite compelling, the, uh, the sun blew out to its right and to the viewer, to our left, it blew out a large, whether it was a coronal mass uh, uh, discharge or a, uh, a solar flare, whatever the case may be, it blew out to its right a large uh, emission, and it momentarily illuminated the second sun and a number of the, the planets in the second uh, sun system. So that tells me that, and this was like a couple of years ago now I saw this video, that tells me that the sun is definitely already interacting on a plasma electric basis with this yep. second solar system. Mm -hmm. It's in the lore, again, uh, of a number of advanced civilizations uh, who, who, who documented the return of this, uh, the Chinese and, and, and a number of the, certainly the, the Near Eastern civilizations, the Babylonians and the Sumerians, so on and so forth. So getting back to your original question, that's why I got into it, because the, the, the video was so compelling. And plus, I'm very sensitive. I'm a, somewhat of an empath and intuitive, and I can feel this thing. I, mm -hmm. I can feel the presence of this yep. this second this second solar system. Yeah, that's amazing. I I feel <clears throat> I feel it as well, and uh, it's also in my knowing. In other words, it's almost like uh, soul memory for me, uh, as if I've you know gone through this system coming in at other times in history, assuming that, of course, you know, I, I believe in reincarnation and I might have been here uh, at different times in, in, in history. Uh, it's almost like I, I know that this thing is comes every so often and there's uh, things that happen with it. Um, so I totally, you know, I, I've also seen those videos, by the way, of, the, you know, when that coronal mass ejection or whatever that was, that plasma thing that illuminated that particular uh, uh, sun with all its uh, spheres and all that. It's very interesting stuff. Um, and so what I'm interested in, too, is, um, you know, understanding that, and, and again, one of the reasons for the show um, is to uh, allow people to start getting uh, familiar with this information so that uh, it inoculates them because I have a feeling that we will be seeing this uh, in, in, you know, in our uh, vicinity pretty soon. And what's the worst thing that can possibly happen is that, um, you know, is that our governments are not going to obviously tell us about it, as you're saying. They are obviously, uh, you know, chemtrailing the skies, as, uh, you know, with, with dual purposes, right? But one of them, of course, being to hide the obvious, you know, where, you know, we can't uh, obviously discern for ourselves that there's something out there. And um, so they're not going to tell us, uh, hey, you know, you guys need to get prepared or whatever it is. And I don't really know that there is much that can be done really on the surface uh, as to why a lot of them have uh, more than likely sought out underground tunnels and underground whatever, you know, and, and have seed vaults going because, uh, apparently, when this thing comes in, um, the surface is really, really changed. Um, to, you know, and I'm putting it really mildly. Um, so, from what I understand, is that they're probably going to give us a window of about 40 days or so, which is not a lot of time for anybody to get prepared. Uh, I've lived through many hurricanes, and I know Serena could probably talk about this as well, where people just go crazy and they go to the store and they just take everything and there really isn't much left and you know in a situation like this it's going to be very difficult to getting supplies so um, again my purpose is to create this awareness so that people are in a, in a good place they're they're in a good space you know uh, spiritually <clears throat> that they're not coming from a place of fear um, and that's that's all I can do at this point because really I think it's this this is something that's inevitable any comments Serena, did, <clears throat> did you want to mention anything, Serena? Um, yeah, I, di I did have a question about what you were talking about. Um, okay, I'm going to play the newbie person and ask some questions that are pretty basic, okay? Um, I have a couple of questions. This system, how, how do we know that this system exists? Aside from the Sumerian texts 
that uh, Sitchin spoke about, and when I read them, to me, they were, you know, like I said to Ari before, it was ironclad. I I just believed everything. However, some people have been coming up lately in the past decade, and they have been finding, you know, some of his uh, work questionable. But I like to look at everything. But how do we know that there is this system? Who is, has there anything uh, been measured or documented? Um, it, aside from lore, is there any hard science that, that is showing this? And 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 this is going to make you laugh. I, I, I know this. Uh, why is NASA not talking about this? Okay. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that's... That, that was meant. That's funny. Yeah, it's that a is. Real question, yeah, yeah, it's, I know it's, it's fun. funny. I mean, it, we it know, yeah. we know why. But this is for people who are like, well, how come everybody is not aware of this, mm-hmm. this, this solar system or this binary system that's coming in? Why is everybody not aware of it? That's a good question. I, I would say, as far as the <clears throat> the proof, the the former director of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Uh, Professor Robert S. Harrington, who's since been assassinated, unfortunately, he became aware of. If one watches the videos of, of, of Marshall Math Masters, I think his name is. He, he's yeah. done a, a lot of good work on the history of so-called Planet X, and how uh, long before the U.S. Naval Observatory and, and Dr. Harrington began delving into this uh, into the subject and. and before that Harrington confirmed the existence of the subject, which I'll, I'll get into in a moment. Okay, the is notion Planet X different from Nibiru? Planet X is kind of a generic term that I can't remember if it was the Naval Observatory or, or some other uh, group of scientists that came up with it. It's kind of a kind of a trendy kind of title that you know, people can just use in shorthand to describe this thing. I think there was a disinformation aspect to it, which I'll explain. Uh, so, just skipping aside all the stuff that that others have uh, postulated over the centuries about a very large uh, planet or astronomical body that periodically returns to our solar system, what Harrington determined was, <clears throat> based on the perturbations of the very large so-called gaseous giants in the outer part of our solar system, Uranus and uh, I believe Neptune, there were perturbations that were, he felt, and uh, some of his team felt, were being exerted by what must have been a very large astronomical body that was many times the size of planet Earth. Uh, It had to be large because it was exerting a gravitational pull that was causing this perturbation of the very large gaseous giants. Also, when when Pioneer 10 was launched, I believe, in 1974, it was uh, a probe headed out to a certain uh, part of space, and it it had information on board that would have advised any kind of advanced ET civilization about the existence of of, of Earth and and our DNA structure, etc., etc. All that was encoded on board, some plaques or something on board Pioneer 10, but the uh, point of relevance is the the telemetry coming back from Planet 10 and, and the tracking uh, of Planet 10 determined that it had been kind of pulled off course. There was something likewise exerting a gravitational pull on Pioneer 10, and, and it pulled it uh, it pulled it kind of out of its intended trajectory, and uh, that also gave the the team around Dr. Harrington and Dr. Harrington himself a clue that something coming up from our southern skies mm-hmm. was was exerting this gravitational effect. Now, they call it Planet X, and it's been postulated that Dr. Harrington suspected it may be something much larger than, uh, than a planet, that it could have been perhaps even another star. I, I don't know if the term a brown dwarf was in, in use back then, but initially he thought it could represent whatever was exerting this gravitational pull, a star. Uh, but he, and it's been postulated, it's, he may have been told to say, no, let's kind of throttle back on this. And instead of suggesting it's another star, let's just say it's a, a planet, we'll call it Planet X, because that's like less threatening, less confronting, uh, as you can imagine. 
<clears throat> and so, and in fact, I think it was a New York Times. It was one of the major uh, uh, dailies uh, in the U.S. at the time had a had a major article about the existence of Planet X. Mentioned Dr. Harrington by name. Now, what Dr. Harrington tried to do, well, what he did do was. He went to New Zealand because he knew whatever it was was coming up from the southern skies. So he went to New Zealand, and I think he brought an eight-inch telescope with him. Gerald Clark talks a lot about this uh, in, in his uh, his discussions, which you can find online. And he went there with an eight-inch telescope for the express purpose of of seeing if he can locate and identify the, the incoming body, and. Unfortunately, before too long, he died of a quick acting cancer, and, and he passed away. Oh my now, God! I hope it yeah, wasn't an and, accident. And, yeah, and yeah. we know that that Black Ops utilizes fast acting cancers. Uh, right. Yep. A number of people have been assassinated in this fashion, so that appears to have happened to Doctor Harrington. There was another doctor. Uh, uh, there's another scientist named Doctor uh, Thomas Van Flandern, if memory serves. That was him. He came up with the exploded planet hypothesis, which may be tangentially related to to uh, Planet X, the brown dwarf. Our solar system it, it has been a cosmic shooting gallery. There have been <clears throat> not only signs on our planet, but elsewhere throughout the solar system on Mars. Uranus is tilted on its side. Something, whatever it was, it was so large and it had such immense power that it caused Uranus to tilt on its side. What Thomas Van Flandern suggests is that there is a missing planet, and some people refer to this as Tiamat. Mm -hmm. and that's that's described in, I, I believe, the uh, Sumerian cuneiforms and in and, and some other ancient texts. And Thomas Van Flandern postulates that where the asteroid belt is, there should have been another planet, a very large one. But somehow, some way, maybe it was due to uh, a, planet, a, a collision between astronomical bodies. Uh, Cummins Beaumont talked about this. In fact, Cummins Beaumont never gets the credit. He was one of the ones who first postulated this, and then Velikovsky later on. Uh, you know, elaborated on it with his books, you know, Worlds in Collision, so on and so forth. But what Dr. Joseph Farrell suggests is that, well, Thomas von Van Flandern doesn't go far enough. He doesn't explain how a planet can be blown apart. Okay, you know, Farrell says, well, I can understand maybe perhaps parts of it being chipped off in a collision, but blown apart, that, that requires a whole another level of, of power. And and then he goes into all that in his book, The Cosmic War, and also in the Giza Death Star Trilogy. I wouldn't say it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but I think it's definitely related because it underscores uh, the fact that our solar system, uh, due to the rather frequent inbound nature of these large celestial bodies, comets, asteroids, whatever the case may be. I just finished uh, not too long ago reading a book about how the Chinese sent out this, this great fleet of huge ships in, in, uh, 14, in 1434. They made it all the way to Italy, and they kicked off the Renaissance by, by providing all this advanced knowledge about agriculture and, and, and whatnot. And, and that fleet may have been wiped out on its return journey uh, near New Zealand when a very large comet uh, crashed into the ocean, into the Pacific Ocean, caused a tsunami which caused a lot of those uh, very large mahogany ships, which dwarfed, which dwarfed like uh, the, the Portuguese and Spanish uh, uh, ships, caused them to wash up way up on mountaintops and whatnot. Wow. So, and this this comment was documented by the Aborigines of Australia. It was documented by uh, by other cultures around the world at a time. I believe that this mini solar system has an entourage. It, it, it has a tail, if you will. And this in part explains not only all the fireballs coming down uh, all over the place. There, there was a video in the recent past of, of Iran, I think it was, where a very large bolide you know, came down. And also, a few years back, there was a very large bolide, that, a meteorite that, that 
exploded in the atmosphere uh, above Russia, which caused a blast that was like many times the size of an atomic uh, blast, and it uh, it caused a lot of damage on the ground. And that's just a relatively small size asteroid. So as this inbound solar system gets closer, and this answers this in part answers your question, Serena, about what is the form of proof that we have. Well, Dr. Uh, Harrington and his assassination, uh, Dr. Thomas Van Flandern, his, his exploded planet hypothesis, uh, the fact that Mars also uh, has exhibited lots of signs of, 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 of surface damage. Some of it may be re uh, the result of a cosmic war. Some of it may be the result of, and I believe some of it has been the result of, of these celestially driven cyclical cataclysms that affect not only our planet but other planets in our solar system. Because we're already starting to see, there's two things that should be underscored here. One is the the outward effect of uh, the seismic activity that's increased, as well as the volcanic activity. And I believe that scalar weapons at HARP cannot account for all of these earth changes and, and the weather patterns and so on and so forth. I, I, I think that some of it, uh, can be accounted for the weather, uh, you know, weaponry and the, the you know bizarre weather we've been having, and some of the seismic activity, some of the volcanic activity can be attributed to harp, can be attributed to next rad, can be attributed to scalar weapons, etc. But not all of it, uh, because it's happening on too large of a scale. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing is is uh, seismic and volcanic activity along the California Nevada border. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in the Ring of Fire in Indonesia and in uh, Japan and other places, and, and volcanoes are going off all over the world. And, and another thing we must take into account is the preparations made by the powers that be, uh, the world government, if you will, are out of all proportion to a simple stock market crash right. like you pointed out earlier Ari yeah. uh, they're, they're building and they continue to build tremendous underground bases and there are people all over the world today who can hear the excavations going on beneath their feet hmm. they can see like overnight suddenly there's a huge pound of earth uh, where there wasn't one the day before or a couple of days before and they can hear tunneling they can hear boring equipment they can hear all kinds of excavation going on beneath their feet uh, the seed vaults that the so-called elite are, have prepared for themselves, and also the the blatant overt efforts at at population control and suppression, where the the police state apparatus, the uh, all the efforts at stripping away every last vestige of every last uh, right is being stripped. And it used to be just gradually, incrementally. Now it's being done by leaps and bounds. Yep. All, all these hoaxed events, and unfortunately, some people are really killed in some of these hoaxed events, uh, all in the effort to to uh, to push the agenda, to push the agenda, yeah. and also uh, pushing the vaccine agenda, yeah. pushing all these different agendas. Uh, it has to be something on a large scale, and then we have to factor in also the fact that, okay, as a very very wise person told me, and. When I say this, I don't mean this in any sense of elitism whatsoever. I mean, people who know me know that's not what I'm all about. That's what I'm fighting against. But there is a very real difference between a purely Earth human who's only had a relative handful of, of uh, incarnations post the, the final, destructions of, final destruction of Atlantis and those who were of, have been described as a, high, of, as a higher human or a galactic human who know uh, within their morphic resonance, within their DNA, mm -hmm. encoded within their DNA, within their innermost being, yep. they've come from other star systems and sometimes from higher dimensional worlds and star systems where they know what complete freedom is. They know what unfettered joy and abundance and happiness is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. bereft of all kinds of negative uh, emotions and feelings like fear, rage, greed, and uh, want and all this other stuff, right? Yes. So they, they know that at a very baseline level, they've experienced that. And they've also experienced, some of them, the exultation and the joy of throwing off an alien oppressor. Yep. Uh, but 
the problem is really <laughs> earth like humans. That. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the message behind the, the, the Stargate movie, by the way, at the very end of it. And also, if you can find it, the director's cut, which shows a lot more stuff. But the, the, and I've been told that the Earth humans actually have a tougher job than we do because many of them were born post Atlantis. So they don't even have any vestigial, residual memory of, of having, you know, uh, undergone those kinds of uh, uh, collective trauma of, of the whole world literally co coming apart, at least a civilization coming apart at the seams. Mm -hmm. And it happened over like a, a protracted period of time. Now, there are some uh, groups of purely Earth humans who, who, you know, unfortunately perished during the eruption of Vesuvius or the eruption of uh, Krakatoa or other uh, types of, uh, uh, of similar activities, seismic or volcanic activities. But the the collective trauma that can only come from having literally like a, a celestially driven cataclysm wreak untold, uh, unimaginable uh, havoc upon the planet. Some of the people that have only had a relative uh, few uh, incarnations, they don't have that in, in, the, in their soul memory. And those that do, it was of such a traumatic nature that they've kind of blocked it out. They don't want to hear anything about Planet X. They don't want to hear anything about UFOs, anything about aliens. They're thoroughly enmeshed in this uh, artificial matrix construct. And so they actually have a tougher job than we do because we know that life exists beyond uh, you know, this physical incarnation. And we know that, that we've a lot of us have come from and will return eventually to these higher dimensional spiritually evolved places. We're basically here on assignment. We're boots on the ground. We're, we're ground crew, if you will. So a lot of these people of the higher human galactic human variety, they have been given visions and dreams and, and uh, actually have memories yep. of, of, of uh, Atlantis, uh, you know, coming apart. And they also have yeah. uh, visions of tsunami waves and, and uh, fireballs coming out of the sky and lava, you know, magma coming out from cracks in the ground and, and volcanic activity on an unimaginable scale. And it's all, see, what's going on is the powers that be, they desperately are hanging on or trying to hang on to, to their control. So what they're doing is they're running all these things in parallel, uh, the, the depopulation agenda, the, the vaccine agenda, the, uh, the global control agenda, and they're trying to set it up so they have as soft a landing for themselves as possible. Some of them have off-world capability, have the right to go, in their scheme of things, to go off-world either via craft or via stargates. Those that are lower down uh, the rung, they have to stay here but they have the, the option of going into these deep underground bases. And then there are like the lower management who have to be on the surface, and really they're just expendable throwaways in the overall scheme of things. But you, you can see the efforts that, 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 that these would-be controllers at different levels, uh, they're, that they're trying to make as soft a landing for themselves as possible. They know that civil unrest may play a role in this, uh, because if fireballs start coming out of the sky and, and other things which they cannot deny, no matter what what they try to do, and if the uh, the trucks can't make it to the stores to provide provisions, and then there's going to be civil unrest, so on and so forth. So they've put everything in place. They're probably going like to let things get out of hand for several days or a couple of weeks, and then they're going to move in the, the, the UN peace enforcement and so on and so forth to try to restore order, so-called, right? But and, and these are just possibilities, probabilities, contingencies that they plan for. Uh, we live in a, a timeline that's been radically manipulated, radically altered uh, by one or more ET races that have uh, time travel capability and time travel manipulation capability. This timeline has been radically altered, and that's that could be the subject of a whole other show. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so... The things that I've described that we've been talking about, they remain probabilities. Nothing is written in stone, and, and anything can change at any time because of this ongoing manipulation of the timeline. But they, 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 they are prudent in that they plan for any contingency and any probability, and I would suggest to 
to your listeners that uh, yes, it's important that we remain uh, maintain our inner harmony and tranquility, and and we ground ourselves and and hold a higher energetic space only by grounding ourselves and remaining embodied. Are we then capable of pulling in higher and higher dimensional frequencies? A lot of people got it the other way around. Exactly. They want to get airy, fairy. They want to go vibrate and raise their uh, frequency first, right? Which yeah. opens up to all, them to all kinds of manipulation, yep. rather than grounding, becoming embodied, and anchoring higher frequencies, which is the way they should do it. It's the safer way. Okay. So this way, no matter what comes down to pike, and there may be something to this. You know, we're going all over the map now. There may be something to this notion that the Earth may, because the Earth is going through its own spiritual evolutionary uh, process. The Schumann resonance has increased. It spiked up at times for the 12 point something. Uh, originally, it was 7.8 for a long time, 7.83, I think. And then for it to spike up to like 12 point something, that's a quantum leap. And also, uh, mainstream physicists, and this, a lot of these uh, articles from the scientific websites have been yanked, but they have been alarmed because they have learned that even stable elements such as, such as carbon-14 are exhibiting rapid decay. So not just unstable elements like uranium, you know, 238, whatever the case may be, are exhibiting a rapid decay, but even stable elements are exhibiting rapid decay. We are, in Star Trek terms, carbon-based units. Yep. Uh, that means we're becoming uh, lighter, more energetic. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps us. That, that boomerangs in our favor, right? Yeah. And so uh, that's another reason why the powers that be are pumping the, the frequencies, the airwaves, with the rage frequency, with, mm -hmm. with harp, with scalar, next rad, weather weaponry, uh, wars and rumors of wars, yep. because they and they're turning loose... Uh, you know, this horde of, of, of demon-infested rapists and pedophiles all throughout Western civilization. Uh, it's all in an effort to, to knock back the resurgence of the divine feminine and also an effort to counteract these intensified cosmic rays and gamma rays streaming in from the galactic core, because that's another factor. Yep. We're once again in alignment with the galactic core. Mm -hmm. and, and also these uh, the, the Schumann resonance increasing is also, and also the... the uh, higher dimensional frequency streaming in, which they cannot. There's, there's a golden energy light field that a lot of mystics, a lot of seers, a lot of psychics have seen and experienced. It's coming in from a higher dimensional uh, place. And, and it's here to help and evolve us and evolve us, right? But they're doing their level best to counteract all that, but it's not going to work in the long run. And so the long and the short of it is maybe the Earth is in its own evolutionary phase, Maybe it, it's going to go through, as the Hopi suggest and other uh, uh, native uh, people suggest, through another purification, another cleansing, mm -hmm. like the fifth world, as, as, as the Hopi call it. And, and who are we, we to say that we that, that's not that we must prevent that? Right. Who are we to say that the Earth does not have the right to clean and cleanse itself and heal itself and throw off all this yep. negativity and whatnot? So. And it's possible, as some mystics and seers and even New Agers suggest, that the Earth may split off into a higher dimensional, higher uh, density version of itself. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be prepared for any eventuality. Some of us may still be ground crew here when you know this other Earth splits up, splits off. And if that's what our role is, if we're still to be meant to be ground crew, then you know crack on. We got a job to do. And, and then if we are part of that element or demographic that splits off with the higher Earth, then you know free will being what it is, we can have the option of coming back if we want to this lower density Earth, going through all these Earth changes, cleansing and purifying itself. And uh, I believe some people that have that option will avail themselves of that opportunity because that's just the way they are. They're, they're ass kickers. They're here to do a job, and, and they're not afraid because they went through this before. They're, they're higher galactic humans. They're not scared of these things. Yeah. We're spirit. We're divine spirit. What's there to be scared about, really? Exactly. But uh, anyway, any you gals want to make a point about that? or? Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I'm I'm totally uh, in alignment with what you're saying. Um, it, it is in my knowing as well. Um, so, um, but what I wanted to um, perhaps also address with you is because you know, in, in reference to this Nibiru Planet X is um, the Anunnaki factor, um, because that is <clears throat> what a lot of people equate 
uh, the, you know, Nibiru being, you know, bringing in, you know, perhaps coming in as, uh, you know, a planet where these extraterrestrial beings called Anunnaki are going to be coming back, or, uh, it, you know, it could be some kind of a vessel. W what are your thoughts on that? Yes, thank <laughs> Thank you, because we could have we could have gone on, or I could have gone on endlessly talking about the the Earth change aspect and sure. you know, the history and the, the science behind it. But let us not forget that, in all likelihood, my feeling, my deep intuitive feeling, is that there is one or maybe two inhabited planets uh, uh, in this mini solar system, and. They've been described as the Anunnaki in, in, in the Sumerian Kanea forms, and the Anunnaki claim credit for creating humanity. I believe that's disinformation. I believe they created maybe point, you know, humanity 4.0, 5.0, or something, or 2.0, but they were not the first. Yeah. Because if, if one is familiar with the work of Michael Cremo and Dr. Richard Thompson, the late Dr. Richard Thompson, uh, humanity, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, or even more advanced versions of Homo sapiens sapiens, have been here for millions and millions of years. I I'm satisfied that's the case. Yeah. And uh, j just to digress for a moment, uh, talk about the origins as as uh, related by other traditions around the world. The Aborigines of Australia say we've been here for over a million years. The Pleiades, we were originally from the Pleiades. There are uh, Native American tribes that say we were from originally from the Pleiades, and some of us came here via Australia, and then we came here. Uh, some of the Native American tribes, such as the Lakota, uh, say we're from Sirius. So I've always differentiated between the, the two main kinds of humanity, if you will, creating civilizations. The, the ones who brought the Aborigines and, and the Native Americans and probably other uh, traditional cultures around the world, the ones that brought them taught them to live in harmony with, with the earth, to, to regard all animals, all flora and fauna, as brothers and sisters were all one indivisible, indivisible monad. Uh, they, they didn't teach them animal husbandry. They didn't teach them agriculture because they were both, in the higher perspective scheme of things, inherently wrong. Whereas the Anunnaki... Right, they they taught animal husbandry. They 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 even claimed to have brought domesticated animals here. They taught agriculture, which rapes the land according to the, the Native American and Aboriginal traditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I believe when the Anunnaki came here, they they saw it as an opportunity to to really establish a foothold. They'd already, according to the, uh, the uh, uh, Sumerian Kanea forms, had already established bases on Mars. And they had decided to create operations here in order to uh, exploit the natural resources, gold, for example. And, and many people are familiar with the lore. I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail about it. But in the process, uh, the uh, Atrabasis, or Atrahasis, I think is the name of the particular ancient text, a lot of the Anunnaki workers... Uh, rebelled against having to toil in the mines for so long. So a decision was made in the Anunnaki Council, the Pantheon, to create a, uh, a slave race, essentially, to toil in the mines. And they were called Lulus, if, if memory serves, right? And uh, what's interesting is we spoke earlier about the, hum uh, the higher human, galactic human perspective. Just as many people have clear past life memories, uh, either have come through in downloads, in uh, visions and normal waking consciousness, enhanced waking consciousness, if you will, and also in dreams and actually in visitations and being told by this, that, or the other higher dimensional ET race. Just as people recall lives as a feline being or lives as, as, a, as a Syrian or, a, or as a Palladian, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, some people also have past life memories of being an Anunnaki. And some people have past life memories of being both, being a higher dimensional, spiritually evolved uh, ET or a spiritually evolved ET in our cosmos. And then uh, for purposes of uh, infiltration, uh, to anchor higher frequencies, uh, spread higher uh, frequency DNA uh, amidst the Anunnaki, whatever the case may be, some people also remember 
incarnating not just once uh, as an Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki inhabit at least one, maybe two of these planets in the brown dwarf system. Uh, there may be more than one ET race in the, the uh, let's just call it the Nibiru system. Yep. And it must be borne out that many people, myself included, have had dreams of what amounts to alien UFO invasions mm -hmm. uh, featuring gigantic, gigantic ships, uh, oftentimes either uh, full spherical globe-shaped shape ships hanging low in the atmosphere yep. or uh, like half-sphere, kind of hemisphere-shaped ships that are just hanging low in the atmosphere, multiple ones, and then smaller versions of them that kind of look, interestingly enough, like, like the... Uh, uh, the Earth-made ships in the Stargate, uh, SG-1 saga, these long uh, rectangular-shaped ships. I've had dreams of them coming this long before this perma-dark chemtrail cloud cover above us. Yeah. I was having dreams of these huge rectangular ships coming down through like gaps in the fake cloud cover and heading straight down to Earth and causing pandemonium, all these ashes falling out of the sky and... Uh, also, seeing I've had those the dreams too. Yeah, me too. I concur. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people, and 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 also seeing the the shadows, the underside of very large craft, uh, uh, passing over above the, the the lighter parts of the fake cloud cover, right? And you just know there's some gigantic craft up ahead. Well, there are endless variations of this, right? Uh, and we know that there's a depopulation agenda, but we also know, and I'm, I'm delving into aspects of, of alien abductions here, uh, the reptilian overlordship, so on and so forth, because this depopulation agenda is being pushed by the reptilian human, Draco human hybrid plantation managers. The, some of them have, some factions have off-world capability, super advanced off-world capability, in, indeed, interdimensional and time traveling, uh, time travel capability. Uh, but in the overall scheme of things, they're getting their marching orders from from off-worlders, uh, Draco re reptilian factions and and reptilian factions and affiliated elements from the Orion system, so on and so forth. If indeed there may be a mass extinction event, mass culling event, and keeping in mind there's already a depopulation agenda that's been going on where we're pretty much at, at zero population growth in the so-called uh, uh, civilized uh, advanced countries. Thank you, Bill Gates. Thank you for all that, right? Right. Uh, but a lot of these beings that, well, I'm just going to come out and say it, that, that have humans as a food source, right? And yep. some of these are subterranean. They've been here all along. Uh, it's a well-documented, well-known fact that people have been disappearing from the national parks and the forest and whatnot. Yep. Uh, and that's it seems to be accelerating. And then there's been lot of hundreds of thousands of people in, in, in the surface population who are dis disappearing routinely every year anyway. Yep. And some could postulate that, okay, this could be due to you know, CIA or whatever, kidnapping rings, whatever the case may be. But all those black ops intelligence agencies on the surface are just run by hybridized reptilian humans anyway, right? right. So it's all part of an overall agenda. And also there's this ongoing uh, human food processing agenda going on with some of the reptilian races that, that, are, that, are, that live underground. Well, what my mentor, Barbara Bartholick, was shown and what others have been shown is that, and this is going back 30 years plus, <clears throat> that there will come a point in time, in their arrogance, they were showing people this through, through holograph screens, which I've seen these reptilian holograph screens that can be very, very lifelike. They can even pull you into the scenery, and, and suddenly you're there in 3D, uh, a part of whatever the scenery is, a war scenery, some other kind of scenery going on. And these people have been shown either in visions, being right into their mind or shown through these holographic screens by the reptilians that some, at some point in the future they may come down in what's been described as huge cattle cars and load up all these people, zombied out, load them all up and haul them away 
as a food source before all, all the cataclysms come and wipe out the surface population. There goes their food source, right? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, go. I hate to be as blunt and glib and flippant <laughs> about it, but, you know, in the overall scheme of things, we are not at the top of the food chain, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you know the, the things that are done to, to, to you know, surface animals is, is horrific, yeah. too, by humans. So, so we are not at the top of the food chain. Now, keeping all that in mind, the inbound return of honor, the, uh, the Nibiru system with perhaps one or two ET races on it, one of them probably the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki who in their mind still control this planet, they've had parlays, they've had uh, tenuous alliances with other ET races. This planet has been a battleground for untold millennia, for millions of years. Uh, there are good books out there that, that to go into this. The Voyagers 2 book is a very good book by um, a gal named, last name of Dean, and there are other people that, that, that write about this. And uh, again, the aforementioned Dr. Joseph Farrell, The Cosmic War. It's quite possible that we're go- we may see, it could be a probable, possible scenario, and they all have different levels of probability and different percentages of, of, of they may transpire or not, higher or lower percentages. But there, we may see like a, a very, very large increase in, in, in UFO activity. We're already seeing that. <coughs> Excuse me. We had that big UFO sighting in, in, uh, in Southern California, which they stupidly tried to dismiss as the reentry of uh, or the, the oh, test yeah. launch of a Trident missile. It's just patently absurd. Yeah. I've spoken to eyewitnesses who, who saw this craft flying, uh, hovering at low altitude and, and observed as F-35 fighters were vectored towards it. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're not going to vector it towards a, uh, towards a test missile launch. So that was a very blatant uh, example of some otherworldly technology manifesting in in Los Angeles of all places, so we we can expect to see more of that because more and more ET races are coming here, and uh, what I'm going to share now, in intelligence terms, will be regarded as non-confirmable data or non-confirmable intelligence. However, the people who have told me this are not New Age Lottie Dodds, not not flakes that spew out metaphysical pablum. They're 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 veterans of the cosmic wars. They're they're seasoned uh, spiritual warriors who've been at the sharp end and have experienced hardcore negative ET reptilian military experiences. But they're also in contact and, in fact, <coughs> excuse me, our ground crew for these high, higher spiritually evolved ETs. And the information they've gotten is that not only is are a lot of what we would regard in, in the spectrum of po- polarities as spiritually evolved, benevolent, peaceful ETs are coming, but also higher dimensional ones are coming. And what they're doing is, <coughs> excuse me, just as we see in the Soho imagery that, that, uh, that monitors the activity around the sun, and we see gigantic uh, Earth-sized ships or larger, sometimes entire squadrons or fleets of them. Yep. Uh, and they're not only of... Uh, of a spherical nature and shape. Some of them are just all kinds of bizarre shapes and sizes. Uh, and uh, there's also a guy that, uh, a young guy that was severely harassed, who, who uh, Jose Escamilla, he's the guy that did the um, the Moon Rising video, excellent mm-hmm. video. Yep, yeah. I love that one. Uh, there's a kid that he worked with that using his uh, high power telescope had taken a, a video of, of gigantic ships out in space. Sometimes they position themselves. Uh, where, where well-known astronomical objects, planets, stars are, et cetera, et cetera, to disguise themselves. But these things are gigantic, and they shapeshift, actually. Uh, so what some of my sources have told me from their higher dimensional ET sources is that, and also Alex Collier mentioned something similar to this, that there's very, very large ships hovering above the Earth, but... A lot of them are in a high, uh, in a the next octave up, if you will, like a higher dimension, where they can observe the activity and they can anchor a higher frequency, uh, through which they can kind of, kind of like monitor uh, activity here and also at some level intervene. I believe that the the intervention by the more benevolent beings is is 
in the past was more subtle, more nuanced. It frustrated a lot of us. Like, where are they? You <laughs> yeah. know, it's like they, they sent us here on this mission, and it's like we've just been cast adrift, right? <laughs> but it, it seems that the, the help is becoming, uh, I would say, more overt uh, on many levels. Whereas in the past it was re seemingly infrequent, subtle, nuanced. Now it, it's because of, you know, this is where it's all coming down. Our little corner of the multiverse, but all the souls on here, on this planet, all the souls, all the beings on here, all the mineral DNA resources and everything else, a lot of these beings want their pound of flesh. It's like they know this, that the possibility exists for a mass culling of one sort or another. So they're going to get their DNA. They're going to get uh, their resources, the mineral resources, whatever the case may be. They want their pound of flesh. They want it now. Because there has been this ongoing soul harvesting, soul recyclement process that's part and parcel of this part of the, the galaxy and, and uh, which these archontic forces have created. It really originates from another dimension, another plane of reality, but it's what shunts us back into this reincarnational process again and again. Well, I feel in order for us to completely do our jobs, not only do we need to help this earth, which has nurtured us through many incarnations, into the next phase and also to heal it of all of its trauma but we must end this process of soul harvesting soul recyclement mm -hmm. uh, we must have the option in future incarnations to incarnate here or not we don't have to keep coming back here especially if our job is done yep. we should be able to incarnate on any planet that we've had or any star system or any world that we've had a past uh, connection with so all that ties into this. So some of these higher dimensional beings have parked their craft above the Earth and in different parts of the solar system. Uh, like I think Alex Collier talks about how the uh, the Andromedans, they're this uh, spiritually evolved race from the Andromeda constellation, and they're they're affiliated, allied, um, spiritually evolved ET uh, colleagues and, and allies. He says, according, <coughs> excuse me, according to the information he's received, that there are uh, very large craft that, that the benevolent beings have parked, like uh, not too far from this uh, asteroid belt. If memory serves, and don't quote me on that, I have to watch his webinar again, his most recent ones. But uh, so it seems that reinforcements have arrived, uh, and so it's all coming down in our little corner of the, the multiverse, and. Uh, Will we be able to take a break for a moment also? Oh, sure, absolutely. Did you need a break oh, uh, at this point? Yeah, 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 yeah. please, please. And then we'll, we'll carry on because I really want to hear uh, your take and, and Serena's take on all this and, and uh, you know, just go from there. Absolutely. So, uh, all right, so we'll I'll take a back. break real yeah. quick. All right. Okay, thank you. Bye.